Welcome to the 2023 CCI Book Club, where we get to hang out and chat about cannabis books. And this year, we're really excited to have all of the authors of the books come live to our calls, which means that we don't just get to like talk about it and guess, we get to actually ask Alia today our questions. So that's really exciting. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Andrea Maharg. I'm a cannabis educator and coach, and I teach all the science over at the Cannabis Coaching Institute. I'm really happy to introduce you to Corinne Tobias, the founder of the Cannabis Coaching Institute, who is living her best life. Where are you, Corinne? Just say it out loud. <laughs> I'm in Mexico. Yeah, I'm best lifing. Yes. <laughs> Highly recommend. <laughs> awesome. Corinne is best lifing in Mexico with her seven-year-old daughter. Corinne's talking about being paid to get to do this work literally wherever you are. Um, she is down in Mexico for a month now working from there while I'm here in Southern Ontario. And we've seen the sun for like three hours in the past 87 days, it feels like. So if this is something that appeals to you to talk to other people about cannabis, to teach other people about cannabis, if you're passionate about this and you want to turn this into a side hustle or a career, that's exactly what we train people to do over at the Cannabis Coaching Institute. We are just starting to enroll right now. You're getting kind of like a little sneak peek. We're starting to enroll for our coach cohort for February of 2023. You are in the first to know. Um, and it, as a cannabis coach, you're trained, you have all the knowledge and skills and support and confidence that you need to be able to go out and help people one-on-one -on -one understand how they can use cannabis, plus a whole bunch of other lifestyle enhancements to feel better, to feel great, to have all these beautiful smiles that we have on the call here, as you can see <laughs> from some of our students and grads who are here with us. So. If you're interested in joining, we will pop a link in the chat and you can use the code book club to save $100 off and get started um, really soon. So we're excited about that. But we are here because we are a book nerd. Okay, like I'll speak for myself. <laughs> I'm a book nerd. Um, I have dozens and dozens of books about cannabis. Um, and I thought I was picking up Alia's book last year to like kind of have like a more lighthearted read. I'd been doing lots of science reading at that point and lots of diving into the history of prohibition in the States reading at that point. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna pick up this like lovely memoir. Um, and it turned out to be not just a memoir, Alia. It was a beautifully, intricately researched journalistic feet that taught me so much about the history of cannabis and prohibition and also gave me um, a really deep insight and connection to people who had actually given up, you know, given up things in the fight for this plant so that I can sit here in 2023 at my computer and talk about this plant openly and, and legally. And your mom was part of that. And you as a kid were part of that. You and I are the same age. We're both born in 77. My mom also liked cannabis when I was younger, not like your mom, <laughs> but like also liked <laughs> cannabis. So I feel such a connection to you because of your book and because of the way you write. And then such a connection to the history of this plant and where it's come from. So um, thank you so much for be being here with us. I'm going to just uh, toot your horn here for you for a sec. So Alia Voltz is the author of the best-selling memoir, Home Baked, My Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. It's a finalist. For, she's a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and winner of the 2020 Golden Poppy Nonfiction Book Award. Congratulations. Thank Home Baked you. was the inaugural pick for the San Francisco Chronicles Citywide Total SF Book Club. That's so cool. And a San Francisco Public Library on the same page selection. Alia's essays appear in the New York Times, The Best Women's Travel Writing, Bon Appetit, and The Best American Essays. And we are so lucky and so grateful that you are here with us today. So 
Thank you. Welcome. Please share a little bit about yourself and why it was important for you to write this and change so many lives by doing so. Wow, thank you so much. That was that was really nice. Uh, I, I was laughing when you um, when you said that you picked this up thinking it would be a lighthearted read and I'm like, surprise. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was always, it was always my intent with this book to um, tell the, the story of a, of a community that I understood to be, um, that I grew, I grew up kind of peripherally to as a child, but I understood to be very underground, uh, misunderstood, often under threat, and especially during the AIDS crisis, um, quite, quite literally dying. Um, and they, they were stories that I so much wanted to tell. And I, and I found, uh, it took me about 12 years, honestly, to find the right way to do it um, because nobody wanted, the, nobody wanted the serious story. I had to kind of sneak it in. Uh, so when you put it that way, it, it, it really rings a bell for me as I, I've, often, I've often thought of the memoir, the kind of the, the aspects of this that are a little bit more happy-go-lucky, a little bit more fun, a little bit more of an adventure story, to be like a Trojan horse, to sneak the information that I really wanted to communicate, uh, both about cannabis and about my hometown, that I, uh, which I care about very deeply, into your minds. Uh, so that the reader isn't going to feel like they're getting a history lesson, um, so that they will feel like they're simply enjoying themselves and along for an adventure. But on the way, they're going to learn some things they might not have thought about with respect to cannabis culture, cannabis activism, and the very important role that that played, as well as the intersection with queer culture, which I care quite a bit about as well. Um, and I, I don't see the two things as separable. So, so that was really where I was coming from with the book. And, and I appreciate that you just nailed that. I've already completely forgotten your question. <laughs> I don't know what you asked. You did. You answered it. I asked what compelled you to write this book. And oh, there we go. <laughs> something that you just said about queer culture was something that I have not seen. So it hasn't been made so apparent to me how mm -hmm. important that movement was in the cannabis legalization movement. Can you talk more about that? Could, could you encapsulate what the queer movement, how that impacted cannabis and where we're at today. Sure. Uh, and, and really this was, uh, as I said, it was a very long journey with this book. I had different, uh, I made a couple different go rounds. I, I tried to publish a version of it in, in 2009. It was rejected by every house in New York and, uh, and, and some in California as well. Um, and what and what shifted around that was that in the lead up to the 2016 election, um, which represented so many things on a national level that we're still dealing with, but in California was also the moment that it was very clear that we were poised to legalize recreational use finally in the state. And so I was I was watching the conversations that were happening around cannabis. And nobody was talking about LGBTQ plus activism. Nobody was talking about the hundreds of thousands of people who died uh, before the first medical cannabis legislation uh, came through, co-authored by Dennis Perone, um, and among others, you know, who certainly worked on that and labored on that. But um, it was so much a part of it. And it just felt, it felt like a terrible disservice to me and and like we owed, I felt like there was a debt of remembrance that was not being paid. And also that if we don't have an understanding of the kind of activism and the sacrifice that goes into winning the rights that, that we then enjoy and that later generations and enjoy and can turn a profit on, we have the green rush, there's all of this, all of this uh, forward movement. Now we have our, you know, THC bath bombs and and, and stuff like that. But, but this all came at an extremely high price. And so I, I was upset, um, I think, by that. And, and that became a fire under, under my butt to, to get a new version of this book together and out, um, with that being an emphasis. To encapsulate the connection, um, I mean, I think it goes back quite, quite far. And it goes 
goes back quite a bit farther than the AIDS crisis. But, um, but that was really a turning point in the sense that the LGBTQ plus community uh, was already very used to fighting. Uh, it was a very strong activist community already in, in the fight for what was back in the day known as gay liberation, uh, although it's a very outmoded term, but that, that's, that's the way back. Um, and, you know, so it was already a very mobilized group. And when people started falling ill and, and dying and the government was not responding, almost seemed to gleefully ignore what was happening uh, in some ways and, and be willing to sacrifice this large sector of the populace, um, the, the, the community was going to fight, you know. And, and it didn't take long for people to realize that cannabis helped with nausea, it helped with appetite, it helped with some of the, the really common and, and in, during the AIDS years, often deadly uh, uh, symptoms and, and conditions that, that one could suffer in, in relationship to HIV AIDS, it became very clear that that was helpful. And so part of the fight to gain access to experimental med medications through groups like ACT UP, et cetera, part of that fight, a branch of it, became the fight for cannabis access. And it was a real turning point um, in the cannabis conversa conversation because people had, been, people had been fighting for legalization for decades. People had been fighting for medical access for decades. There were forerunners that had nothing to do with HIV AIDS or the queer community, of course. Um, but this was something that was in the late 80s and early 90s, so, so in people's faces um, that you really, you really couldn't ignore it anymore. Um, and it's quite nuanced as far as, uh, you know, what the particular stories were that turned, the, that, that, that changed the barometer. And, and we can talk about that as well. But um, it, 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 remains, it remains complicated. And the activism of, of people of color uh, is also is another branch of, of similar but different um, and yet connected, very deeply connected. Uh, and so all of this is kind of happening at the same time. But it, it, is, it is my opinion, my studied opinion, that we would not have the kind of access that we have today without the HIV AIDS crisis and the work of AIDS activists. Thank you so much for bringing light to that really important conversation. So I'd love to open it up to people who want to talk to Alia and ask her about the book and get all your questions answered. I know, Maureen, that you, you're you definitely <laughs> really excited for this conversation. Do you want to start us off? Sure. I, I think um, you hit on the whole bringing the um, AIDS epidemic to, to my awareness, even though as a dietitian in the 80s, I was fully aware of Marinol. Uh, dradabinile being used, but when I never put like the two and two that they were really part of the, um, basically the Compassion Care Act, which was the first, mm -hmm. right, in, in California-ish. And so, um, you know, it, it kind of um, just connected it for me and bringing um, that group into the fold where I, I knew that, but I didn't, you know, it was just able to bring it um, closer to the forefront of their activism for all their rights, let alone, you know, medicine that should be for everybody. Uh, then the other question I sent into Andrea was about um, what really hit me was when, you know, went back to um, San Francisco um, after, you know, your mother's friends were, um, you know, so sick and really needed her and seemed like she needed them too, but can't deny, um, you know, from working in hospitals and caretaking and so forth, um, that, you, that you were young, but seeing such um, sickness and, uh, you know, death. And, and so how did that affect you? And then where do you, do you take that into your life? Because that's mm. rare, you know, that's a rare window, you know, 
And so I, I felt that for you. I, I identified mm-hmm. that that was, Ooh, that was really great of your mom, obviously, but then to not shy you away from that. Um, I'm sure that shaped you. So that, that was another thing that really hit me, um, part of the book. Yeah. So that sure. was, awesome. um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I think this, this, this practice of sh- shielding children is very American, very 20th and 21st century, uh, children grow up in war, children grow up in plague, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, we have a convention, um, in this, in this particular culture of shielding children in a way that might, I don't know if that's even natural, you know, <laughs> um, but that entirely aside, uh, I want to say that I feel, and I have always felt, um, grateful to have had the opportunity to witness up close and personally and experience true bravery, um, true courage, and and true compassion. Um, you know, there's a, this, this experience, of course, I'm traumatized by some of the memories, right? You had so many situations where it's the dying caring for the dying, like what could be more heartbreaking? And there are people who you love and care about and as a child, people that I thought of as uncles and aunties, and you don't think these people are going to, you know, waste in front of your eyes. Um, so of course it was hard, and it, and it was very othering. It was very othering in the context of other of, of dealing with other children, going to public school, and being unable to talk about it because of the the necessity of keeping keeping it secret as it was illegal. Um, so there's an aspect of it where sure it was traumatizing, sure it was othering. But there's also an aspect of it where I, I feel I feel really privileged. I've I have a very I have a very defined sense of morals um, that I think is in 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 part because of that. Um, and it has, has nothing to do with a, a religion or a teaching or you know anything anybody ever told me. But I saw I saw what it means to care for other people. Um, I'm not even talking about my mom, although she's she's obviously in the picture too. But just the the fortitude that came out of that community at that time in, under under the worst kind of duress um, was extraordinary. So um, so you know, especially as an adult looking back on it, I feel privileged. At the time, obviously, it was hard. Um, I don't know. And it, it, it was, this is sort of a, it's sort of a different issue, but you mentioned Marinol and it, it was so interesting because Marinol, Marinol was, and, and similar drugs were actually, were anti-activist um, efforts, I guess I would say, because um, the pharmaceutical companies and the government, which is so much, so connected with pharmaceutical companies, as we know, um, couldn't, I didn't see a way to monetize cannabis, certainly not while it, while it was scheduled and as it is still scheduled. And so Marinol is kind of wild because it's pure THC. There's nothing to mitigate it. There's no CBD. There's not, there's not, none of the other cannabinoids that are going to soften this like knock your head off um, psychedelic experience. And so many of the people, I've never taken it, but many of the people that I interviewed who did take Marinol in the days because they were able to access it earlier. It was like a way, it was like a, a way to monetize cannabis and to avoid admitting that it should not be scheduled as a, it should not be schedule one, that there were medicinal values. It was a way to, to sidestep it. But the people I who I've spoken to who took Marinol were like so overwhelmed by the effects that I think most people found it. Un, un, impossible to take, uh, intolerable, um, because you really needed a whole plant experience, I think, uh, to get the beneficial results. I don't know. I am not a scientist, and I and I there are people in this room who know a lot more than I do, but um, <laughs> but I don't want to take pure THC. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot wrapped up with pharmaceuticals and cannabis. Totally outside of this conversation, actually, that we can talk about. Um, Yeah, thank you so much for sharing how that impacted you. 
Is there anybody else who has a question? Cause I've got like 80 here. Like I could go <laughs> folks. So you're going to have to jump in and stop me. <laughs> but ask me anything. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I do not get offended. Um, whatever, whatever anybody is curious about is fine. Billy, I think, is it William? Yeah, go ahead. But, um, I go by Billy, but my name is William. <laughs> I'm welcome. <laughs> Tricking you guys from the beginning. No. Uh, <laughs> hi, I just had a, I had a question for you. Um, I actually heard about your book through a friend because I'm in France and she lives in the South and I went to go visit her and she had your book. Judge? Was, is it Judge? It is totally Judge. <laughs> okay. It is totally Judge. <laughs> yeah. She actually sent me the link for this. I didn't know it was happening. She's like, here you go. Oh. I was like, yes. <laughs> so my question for you, I actually submitted the question, so it might be on the list of 80 questions. I have no idea. <laughs> but my question for you is in response to um, higher education and cannabis specifically. What are your thoughts or even your feelings on cannabis um, being discussed in higher education, specifically universities? Does that make you uncomfortable or because I've actually referenced your book along with others in some of my classes discussing descriptive writing, using cannabis as a focus point, saying like here, try to use an image to describe something that's culturally taboo in France and mm. in certain locations in the United States as well. And so they, they really seemed interested by your book. And I was just curious, does, do things like that bother you? No. No, no, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful compliment. Um, I did, I did feel in publishing this book, uh, there was just, I didn't know how it, how it would land. Like, I, I feel like it is time for us to, as humans, acknowledge that cannabis is not, it is, has not been properly described by human governments anytime recently. Um, and certainly not under um, under American guidance, uh, which affects also how many other countries handle it um, through 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 das dastardly back channeling and and whatnot. But um, yeah, no, I, I I I would love for it to be understood a little bit better on its own terms outside of the context of um, a drug war issue a I mean, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm misstating that because I do think that historically, I think we need to understand the various wars on drugs. Um, I think we need to understand the racism inherent in ca cannabis regulation. I think that needs to be talked about in that context. But I also, I also think that cannabis can be discussed on, on its own terms and that there's still so much to explore as far as po the potential and also the limitations. Right now, uh, there's this kind of there's this kind of wild amount of information, um, and I, and I'm sure that the people in this group are are hip to this and discuss it. But there's this wild amount of in, wild combination of of scientifically based information, information that is true but is not ver scientifically verified, information that is totally false, both both officially and unofficially. I mean, it's just it's just kind of wild. So the more that um, that thinking people and um, serious, serious people and students can can address these issues, the better it will be for all of us going forward. Uh, and also, um, thank you for discussing my book in the context of writing, because I appreciate that. It's such a good book. So <laughs> thank you for writing it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And we're starting to see more and more higher education programs that are actually focused on cannabis. We have students, we have people in this class who have taken their master's in cannabis science. So it's coming that cannabis is getting into higher education. I have never, I have never considered it from your angle, Billy, that you're like, I'm going to teach about creative writing from around the world and we're going to use cannabis as a context and let's go <laughs> like that. That's sneaky. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Well, I was just kind of curious because, you know, we talk about these these cannabis programs in the United States, but there's no discussion about international students whose, co whose countries outlaw mm -hmm. cannabis or the research or study of, the, of this plant. They can't come to the United States and study cannabis 
or follow through with these master's programs. And so I was just curious as somebody that teaches international students, even if I were in the United States, you know, my focus is in linguistics and TESOL. So I would still be teaching international students. A lot of them don't have the right to take any courses dealing with cannabis. So mm -hmm. I love the fact that there are courses now dealing with the cannabis industry. There are whole programs, but I was just curious about that situation in particular because there's not a whole lot that international students can do in response to this industry. Well, I, I hope I just add to that because this is, it, it's an anecdote, but let me just throw it in there. Um, I started a couple of years ago, I was contacted by a, a high school in California that has Writers Week every year um, where they have writers come and visit their high school classes to talk about what it's like to be a writer and try to inspire them. And they they reached out to ask if I would come and speak at a class. And I was like, I had to write back, you know, do you know what my book is about? <laughs> is this, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And they did, and they were fine with it. And they've had me back a couple of times. And it, it feels, it's a little strange to me because I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't use euphemisms. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie about it. And so, and, and some students, like maybe they think they're being cheeky, are going to ask questions about cannabis or my cannabis use or what I, you know, whether or not I think it should be legal and at what age or, and, and maybe they think they're getting one over, but, you know, I, after the last time I thought I wasn't going to get invited back, honestly, um, but I did. So there is a high school <laughs> in the South Bay that is that is actively involving a cannabis writer, and I'm not sure why. Because <laughs> it's wonderful and needed. And William, June said that, like, June was the one that I was talking about with her master's program, that they have international students. And one thing that international students can do, or people who live in prohibition states, we have some here, is learn about the cannabis plant and then talk to other people about the cannabis plant. That is not illegal. It's not a, it's not illegal to learn about this and to talk to other people about it. So um, this is one of the reasons why Corinne started the Cannabis Coaching Institute was to give people a way into this industry despite all the barriers that are put up here. And I'm just going to plug it while I'm here that we have a brand new free class called How to Get Paid to Talk and Write About Cannabis that you can take. It's on our website, CannabisCoachingInstitute.com, and you can sign up for the free class and it's lovely. So, all right. Yeah. Never shut the fuck up. That's what that stands for in the chat right there. <laughs> and that is our feeling about talking about <laughs> cannabis in the Cannabis Coaching Institute. So thank you, Kirsty, for that. All right, Diane. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here, Leah. And um, I am from Boise, Idaho. I was introduced to your book by Danielle Simone Brand. And we had emailed a few times last year, but uh, I so enjoyed your book. And I agree with Andrea as far as it was the writing was lighthearted and made me giggle, you know, in spots, just picturing it. And just in other spots, I wanted to cry. I still want to cry today when I think of, you know, the warriors, like everyone's talking about, that came before all of us. And just want to thank you for sharing their stories with us. Um, I am waiting for the fucking movie. <laughs> You <laughs> there's got to be a movie that's just there's got to be I just think somebody has got to get a hold of this and and make a movie because it would it would just blow people's minds because it has all of that it has the social history which I absolutely love but also the heart and soul of what your mom and your dad and all of their friends you know lived through um, so talking about your mom and dad, dynamic personalities, and, you know, we're all products of our parents, right? Genetic wise. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, who were you more alike? 
what did you get from each of of them? <laughs> um, I, too I am personal. I apologize. No, no. But... Honestly, nothing. It's fine. Uh, I, I don't think anything is too personal. Um, I, I'm a lot like my mom. I'm a lot like my mom. I have streaks of, of my dad for sure. But uh, through, through much of my life, she raised me. Um, after my, my folks divorced, I, I became very attached with her. And, uh, and even before that, I was kind of, I was kind of by her side all the time growing up. So I'm, I'm quite a bit, I definitely take after her. I'm quite a bit like her. I'm a little bit more analytical, like my dad. Um, uh, I, I draw a little bit from both really, but, um, it's kind of interesting because there was a real shift that happened both during and then especially after the writing of this book. I, I had been estranged from my dad for quite a long time. Um, when I started this, uh, we weren't talking much at all. And, or if we were talking, it was kind of that like civil safe sort of a connection. We would go to a museum and have lunch. And then if you get out of it without anything personal happening, you feel like it was a good day, you know? Um, but it, through doing the research for this book, in order to bring his character to life, uh, I needed to really understand his point of view. Uh, and I had kind of, I think in my own mind, villainized him growing up. Um, I'd been disappointed by him and, and was angry and was resentful. And so I had this certain idea about where he was coming from and what he had to offer. and writing this forced me to kind of put my journalist hat on, set aside the personal issues, and really try to understand what he was going through as a closeted man, as uh, somebody who was in a relationship with, with uh, a person who was quite a bit more dominant uh, than he was really, and how he struggled with that. And I really had to like get in, you know, get into it. Um, and through that and the what what really became two-way sharing between us, we became very close. And uh, I'm I'm much like I, I really enjoy being with him now. I really enjoy talking with him now. Um, we hang out, we have fun, there's nothing really off the table anymore. There aren't subjects that we can't touch. So the air was really cleared. And the other really interesting thing that happened was that my dad and my mom became friends again, and they really hadn't been. But through this whole process, they started talking and they will call each other up now and um, catch up. They play words with friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it, it also really, really helps that my dad is, is finally to everybody's immense relief out of the closet and in a, a wonderful, stable relationship with um, with a really, really great guy who's been with for quite some time now. Um, so that that made a huge difference. But um, yeah, it was it was <laughs> it was such an interesting process because I just I never that was that was like the one that was the one consequence that I never saw coming that that we would all be friends again. Um, and even Barb and my dad are friends. Like everybody's friends again. It did. I just, I just never saw it coming. Um, yeah. It's sometimes the opposite, right? You write a book, and then people are like, "Oh, I am not happy about that. <laughs> we right. are not going to get along after this." I think yeah, you did a good job. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you. Um, but it, it's also, it's kind of, um, what is the word that I'm looking for? I'm blanking on it. There's a really smart word for this, but I can't think of it. Um, there, there's, there's an ongoing conversation in the world of memoir about this, and there's kind of a truism about it. And, 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 and memoirs, we run into a lot of anxiety around this, and we deal with a lot of anxiety. Whereas, like, if I tell my truth, am I going to lose the people who are closest to me? And there are certainly are situations where people do. Um, but I think that another thing that happens is that people then refrain from exploring 
the truth of their past with their supposed loved ones and in 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 not creating that space or allowing for that space to exist um i mean you don't give them a chance i had basically written my dad off um and when i'd go to when i would have lunch with him or something like that i would go in very guarded and avoid topics that i thought might be difficult and um and really what a what a shame what a loss you know because in instead um instead we could work through those things and actually have a close relationship it's tricky though <laughs> and um and so it we talk about this a lot in the memoir community um and i i tend to encourage people to to go for it uh because my experience was so positive but i also i also know that uh, some people have a really hard time it 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 very much also depends on um the attitude that the writer comes into it with because if you're there to pick a bone um you know obviously there's what's like what's the point that's not going to do anything for a relationship but more importantly from an artistic perspective if you're there to pick a bone it's obvious to, to, to the reader and I, and I don't think it's good writing um, in general. I don't think it tends to produce good writing. Sometimes there are some good ones, but I don't think it tends to produce very nuanced or interesting writing. And so it was really that, it was like the artistic standard that I wanted to hold myself to that made me set the personal thing aside because I realized that if I, if I don't, if I'm getting angry right now, I'm not going to, it's not going to be a good book. I'm not going to be able to write honestly. Um, and, and, and so it was kind of like, uh, it was almost a way of tricking myself into a space where I could maybe, where I could hear him for the first time without being defensive or angry, because I really, I just wanted to get, I just, all I want to know is, all I want to know is what color the chair was, Doug. That's all I want to know. <laughs> but if you're, if you're coming into it like that, um, the other things slip in and, and you can get a fuller picture. Well, thank you for walking into this book with artistic integrity because I really felt like I got a super full picture of your parents in all their glories and all their foibles, which you know, allows me as the reader to realize, oh, we're all freaking human. So <laughs> I want to circle around. Actually, does anybody have any questions before? Okay, I'm going to circle into the art because I'm so curious about the art with the bags. And like, I was, I don't understand how you were, how, how they were being produced like how everyone was getting their own bag with the same design yeah. on it without photocopiers can you talk more about that and we yeah, also want to know can, whether can, prints are available show you some of the bags um i have um i have like a hundred i think it's 125 of them that i have um these are just kind of stuck together but they're so it's just a lunch bag. It's a it's like a Z lunch bag. I have obviously quite a few that are not in that are not in the book. You know, we just had to pick some, and in the end, um, it which was fun. Um, and there are some like God. Okay, here's here's an outtake. It says, "Crazy pictures, baby keeps slowing us down," um, and that is clearly my dad. Uh, that is clearly my dad at a time when he's having arguments with my mom. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, he's an oversharer. And so, of course, whenever whenever they were having arguments, it would end up on the bag. It was like, and then she would have to go around and hand it out to all their friends. And people would be like, are you okay? <laughs> is everything okay at home? um so i'm sure that was a lot of fun but um they were just they were just very creative i have the i have original artwork as well so what they would do is they would draw um they would draw pen and ink this is 
the logo, which ended up being on t-shirts. I still have a few t-shirts, by the way, if anybody wants one, I still have a handful, but um, I had some made when the book first came out. Um, so I have that one framed, but mostly they're just, they're just like drawn on whatever paper. And then my dad cultivated a client in a screen printing shop in Noe Valley. And he would, they, they bartered everything in back in the day, in the seventies anyway. Um, and so he would trade a dozen brownies or what have you to the kid who worked at the screen printing shop who would print them on the lunch bags. Um, it was wonderful for me as, as a writer because uh, my dad has some archivist tendencies, um, bless his heart. And so he late, he, he didn't date them, but he numbered the bags that I have here so that I was able to put them in order. And I, and I was able to figure out I just had to find a couple of holidays because there's like a Christmas bag you know? and um, you find a couple of holidays. And then from there, I was able to figure out what the bag uh, for a given week was, what was June 1978. And it became a, um, a sort of alternate history or, you know, it was, it was almost for, for me as a researcher, I mean, it was almost kind of like I had this um, this underground, com it was an underground comic, I think for everybody, but it was like, I had this, this, um, pictorial narrative that went with the story and I could tell when they were fighting. And sometimes I can tell what they're fighting about. I could tell like when the, the Jonestown massacre happened, the, the bag related to that, when the Dan White trial was happening, the bag related to that. Um, and and so it was fascinating. There was like, there was this time when my I, I think I wrote a, I think it's I think it made the book. Like so so much got you know moved around or or cut. You you do a lot of editing, but there was a time when my mom went out of town and my dad was having affairs with guys and and he did this devil and like bodies writhing. And it like you know it lined up exactly with the dates when she was gone. You know you could just see, and he didn't remember that connection, but you could put it together. Um, and then the other resource for that, um, are the other resource for that are the are the brownie books. So there are, I guess I have five of these, and um, they're uh, it's going to be hard to see, but there are photo albums of. Um, the salespeople, as they would dress up to go out to sell the brownies, and I could also, I could also pin these to dates. It was just this amazing resource, so I could tell, you know, on a given day, what they're wearing, um, what the vibe is like in the warehouse. Um, who's hungover, who's pissed off, you know, and also like when they're feeling happy and in love and everything is golden, you can tell that's there too. So, um, and sometimes like the, the other drugs they're doing are there or, you know, um, other characters come and go. So as I'm trying to reconstruct this narrative, I had this wild combination of, of things where the, um, the library did me an immense favor, not for me, but served me where they archived all of the Chronicle and Examiner um, newspapers going back to, I think it was like 1918 through the late 80s or something like that. But I had I had this big period that was in there and you could search it. it was a, it's a searchable database by, by term. Um, so that was immense. So I could look at what's happening on the news on a given week, I can look at um, I, ca I can look at uh, what's happening visually and what's happening artistically all, all at the same time, and then interviewing because honestly, owners not the best, not the best um, at, at chronology. <laughs> like the interviews, the interviews were they were sort of great stories, but they're not attached to dates and they're out of order, and you know so. It was it was quite a, quite an interesting task to put all of that together into some kind of a narrative.
Um, and then I had each person read um, their, at the very least, the sections that they are featured in, um, so that if there was anything that didn't feel true to their experiences, I could I could work on it before it was published. That was very important to me. Not a, a memoirist often do. There's like a I don't want to say it's taboo, but it's considered in general a bad idea in the memoir community to let other people influence your memories. But I wanted to make sure in this case. Can you talk to me about um, your impression of of how your parents feel about all this? Because I assume back when your mom's toting a two-year-old around in a stroller, taking pictures of her friend, making brownies, having fights with her husband, that she's just like living her life, right? That she's just yeah. going about her regular day. And now all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, but now there's people like me who sit around in my couch in Canada and think about your mom and think about the impact that she's had on on the fact that I'm here and that I'm able to do this like what's it been like for your parents to have their lives be out there like this yeah I, overall positive um definitely interesting uh for my mom you know it was really cool uh with my mom because she, she's very supportive the whole time she's always been very open um and she's a, she's a stage hog, of course. So she loved the attention, and um, and I think people in general, especially people of a of a more mature age. I, I just want to say, like when I started interviewing, I was so worried that people wouldn't want to talk to me about their illegal activities of yesteryear. When I started interviewing was before um, there before we had uh, much in the way of legality, also. So it was still pretty taboo when I started um, asking people about this. And I, I didn't know if people were going to talk to me. You know, I was very baby writer. I was very nervous about it. But I found that especially people, you know, getting up in their years a little bit um, were really eager and, and interested in exploring their, their own stories and trying to understand the context. Um, and for my mom, it was really cool because she didn't think of herself as a pioneer at all. She really didn't. She didn't think of herself. She thought of herself as an activist, but in very specific contexts. Um, she was somebody who just did what, and still does, still is, somebody who does what she thinks is right and conscionable at a given moment. You know, she's not thinking through it. So she didn't, she wasn't able to see herself in historical context. And that was something that I could give her because I did all the research. She didn't do it, you know, she doesn't, she still isn't like all that up on the latest um, development in cannabis politics. That and that and and or science. And and that certainly wasn't where she was coming from in the 70s and 80s. Um it was more like, well, this is fun, I need to make rent. And then it was. Well, you know, now I have a kid. Now I really need to make rent. And then it was, well, my friends are sick, and now I really need to do this. Um, I had now I have more of a reason to do this and not get caught. So she's looking at it from that perspective. Um, so I was able to, I was able to give her this sense of of impact that she had. But she really, she really was a pioneer, and she didn't know it. Um, for my dad, it was it was interesting in a different way. Uh, it was a lot harder for him. Um, because he's he's kind of not the hero of the story. He wasn't on his best behavior um, throughout this process. And um, very much to his credit, and something that I will eternally be grateful to him for, is that he, he decided early on that it was it was my story to tell and um and that he was going to serve it i think i think that there was maybe a way i think he may have seen an an opening to kind of make up for lost years between us and it, and it was that um so that he was able to give me something that i really needed that could really further me uh where maybe he wasn't able to be 
a father for me when I was a preteen, for example. But he was able to really support me in this by by going like, okay, I don't look great on the page, but you know, this is your story. Um, and it was also, I think, really interesting for him because he's he has a damaged memory from from the epilepsy um, and from the the drugs that he had to take for the epilepsy also had had uh, detrimental effects on his memory. So there are huge chunks of things that are gone. And then some of that is also selective. So he, he conveniently forgets his worst behavior. And it was very hard for him sometimes to have to confront um, some of the more hurtful things that he did in those days for whatever reason, right? Um, but he was able to, he was able to look at it from a perspective of, well, I wouldn't do that now. I'm, I've grown from that place and I can acknowledge that, that I, I did these hurtful things, um, back when I didn't know any better at the time. Now I know better. So he was able to do that. That was great. Um, and it also, I think he had lost so much, um, uh, memory wise that he also felt, he's told me many times, um, that he was just really thrilled to be able to live the history of it um, because he'd forgotten not just the shitty things that he has to now take responsibility for, but he'd also forgotten a lot of the good times. Um, and and so, you know, every, really all of, all of the people in, who I interviewed who were a big part of the story have, have told me how much it brought back for them, you know, so it's a nostalgia thing is 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 nice. For folks as well. Thank you so much. Something that I something that I like to ask people who are in the cannabis industry is, or not in the cannabis industry, but like who have their eye on this space, and you have like a deep, lifelong, intimate knowledge with this space. Is what is something that's really exciting to you about the future with cannabis? Or do you have something that's like really like making you angry? Do you have a passion in either direction here? Both. I mean, I okay. have both. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, small, small confession here. Uh, I don't, I don't actually use a lot of cannabis myself. I'm not a big consumer. Um, I obviously am passionate about the culture and I'm passionate about the politics and I love the world that I grew up in, but um, but I do, my body doesn't always interact very well with cannabis. Um, so I'm really excited about the specificity of the products because now I can get things that just do the one thing that I want them to do, um, and they don't you know make me socially anxious or they don't make because I, I get I get quiet, I get in my head, sometimes I get a little depressed. Like I have a I have a reaction to it that is not always pleasurable. Um and that's mostly high THC products I, I don't respond well to. Uh but you know I now I have something that I take for sleep that helps so much with my insomnia. And I ha I have things that I can use on my body for sore muscles that are, you know, are so great. And I don't have to worry about about the things that that might backfire on me if I'm in a social in the the wrong context, right? So that is thrilling. Um, on a, on a bigger scale, I'm really excited and hopeful um, that as the stigma din diminishes more and more, um, that we'll be able to get deeper into the medicinal potential, because I think that it I think. It is my sense. I am no scientist, but it's my sense that, that this is the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, and that the way the endocannabinoid system fits with this plant, we should be able to do a lot more with it than than we are if we can just get over this bullshit. Um, uh, the, 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 the bureaucracy and the and the pharmaceutical industry's influence, so on and so forth. Um, as far as frustrations and fears, 
obviously the 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 corporatization the monetization the tech bro itization <laughs> the um the way that um you know really the communities that have been the most harmed by this just endless war drugs um it's still not over even you know even though it is officially not not being talked about so much but um you know communities of color um uh, off grid or low grid hippie communities that have always from the beginning of this issue been targeted um are st still on the losing end of this situation and 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 it's just it's very um it's very frustrating and i don't see i see pockets where um where the industry and the politics are trying to right some of the wrongs and are trying to uh create spaces that i don't know um create spaces that take that into account but I'm very cynical about it. I'm skeptical of it, and um, and I see there's a lot of lip service. And ultimately, I see I see venture capital. I see, you know, rich white boys um, doing their rich white boy thing, and um, and I see communities like Willits, where I lived as a kid, um, dying. But right? really, the community's dying. Businesses are shuttered and boarded up before COVID. Um, that was already happening and um yeah so that like the it was it was really the can the underground cannabis world which which although um for for as much as it should not have had to be underground for as much as it should not have had to be prohibitioned it the 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 marginalization of that world also made it a very beautiful and and safe and protected space for those who lived within it in a way that I, I fear is lost. So cannabis, cannabis um, cultivators and, and dealers and weed kids um, had to stick together. We did stick together and supported one another. And it was, it was cannabis money that, uh, that funded schools. It was cannabis money that funded fire departments. It was like, you know, in, in places like Willie, little towns in the Emerald Triangle. And and um, those people are, by and large, I think, left out of the green rush. And that is tragic and offensive and unconscionable. So um, there's there's that side of things. I don't have any solutions. I'm not I'm not a solutions person. <laughs> just gonna tell you what's bullshit <laughs> yeah we did that too a lot yeah. here at the cannabis <laughs> coaching Institute. <laughs> thank you so much alia i love how some people like go and watch sports i like come to cannabis book club i'm like yay like you cheer <laughs> you like cry you're like no <laughs> um i saw some of you all doing that too so i noticed it's a shared experience that we have so that's really it's really wonderful <laughs> we're so grateful to have you here um i've had this thing that kept looping around since the beginning of this conversation where I realized that all three of our moms were weed moms. And I was like, my mom was a very closeted mm -hmm. weed mom, like South Side of Chicago, like everything was hidden, but we knew, mm -hmm. but we weren't allowed to talk about it. You know, it was like, my parents were terrified they would get busted. You know, and I was thinking about how, you know, like this overall arcing, you know, theme in this conversation is that we owe a lot, a debt of gratitude to these people who were so brave, like insanely brave. And like, we have to be a little bit brave now, you know, and I don't, I like to think that, you know, while we were having this conversation, I was like, I totally would have been that person. I would have done that. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't know, man. I, you don't have to, thank goodness. And now, like my kid gets to go to school and tell everybody that her mom works in cannabis. And like, she's like my hype woman. She like goes in and she's like, yeah, I know about all that stuff. And now she's bored. She's already over it. At seven, she's like, right. oh, God, if I have to hear any more about cannabis, I'm not talking about it anymore. It's not cool. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, like, how fucking lucky are we that we've come that far in a couple of generations from, like, uh, from one generation from us having to be super closeted about our parents' even use and then us be able to do this? Um, that's fucking, I mean, it's really awesome. That's and amazing. obviously, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the, that's the other thing. I think that's part of why I don't use much cannabis is like, there's no, there's no mystique. <laughs> I mean, it's just, um, it was never naughty. <laughs> it was like, 
we just part of fun. There's a little bit of a loss in that. <laughs> yeah, you skipped straight from like like naughty canvas. You're like, and we've got topicals now, and I've got like my formulation with that's a balanced ratio. <laughs> like you just skipped right, blow right through the cool factor. All right, I'm gonna get my get more water. Are right, you go ahead and wrap this up, Andrea? Yeah, thanks so much. That was a great way to close this out. Um, was to think about, yeah, there's still a whole shit ton of problems in this space, but the gains that we're making um, by raising little can of kids right now and by having these conversations out loud and by you coming and discussing this more further or more deeply with us, it's, you know, this all helps. So thank you from everyone. I can see the chat is very uh, grateful as well. So thank you, Alia, so much for coming on. Um, and for everybody who's been here with us as part of this conversation and holding space for this important topic, we really appreciate it. Next month on Book Club, we are going to be reading Midlife Magic by Kim Sarsons. If you are not a woman who is in your midlife, this is still a great book for you. She is actually a Cannabis Coaching Institute graduate and her um, book gives really practical, actionable advice about how you can use um, cannabis to improve and maintain your health and wellness. She's got great um, um, recipes in there. It's a fantastic book. So pick that one up. And then I just want to um, move forward to March. We're reading a medical cannabis primer. Fantastic. If you're just getting your toes wet in this space, um, lots of great pictures, graphs, charts. It's super visual. It helps us to really understand the plant super well. So that's March. And then April, we're reading Curious About Cannabis, which is like Last year we read Smoke Signals and it was like this thick. That's how oh. thick it felt. Yeah. <laughs> this year we're reading Curious That's About Cannabis. One. And it is like, it's like, it just lights up the nerd side of my brain so hard. But you have to start reading it now. Okay. Because it is very big. <laughs> so it's, we always say punishment book for the last one. We're like, okay, the, <laughs> we're going to warn you out of time. You're going you to like, it's going to be good. It's going to be worth it. But start now because... It's going to take a minute. Yeah. yeah. I, I should probably, if I may, I should probably plug this, if only because it just came out today. Um, this is, this is uh, brand new, oh, just today. Cool. Um, it's an anthology, and I have not really, I have a little piece in it, but I haven't, I just got my copy, so I haven't had a chance to read very much. But um, it talks about, like, uh, I don't know. Getting high in swimming, getting high in doing housework. Uh, I, I wrote about talking with all the, the pleasure of talking with your elders um, and involving cannabis. Is it just different ways that people in, involve cannabis in their lives and what it brings them. So I think a pretty light, I think. Although again, haha, <laughs> there's something <laughs> sneaky in there, isn't it? there? <laughs> What's that? I was gonna say, like you've like you've snuck something sneaky in there, haven't you? <laughs> I, I snuck a little. I snuck a little sneakerl in there. <laughs> yes, um, but that might be a fun one for down the road. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate everyone. I hope to see you all next month. Uh, head over to cannabiscoachinginstitute.com. Check out our awesome free class, and we'll nerd out with you again in a month. All right. Thank you so much for having me. You you were all, all wonderful. I really appreciate it. Brighten my day.